This is Startup Storefront. Change is constant. It's inevitable. But it doesn't always have to be bad. Hentifiers aren't strangers to their neighborhood. They're from the community, and they're trying to build up the community that's near and dear to their hearts. From Hentification, we get Hentify, a development company founded by Barney Santos. The goal is to act as a catalyst to stimulate economic growth through entrepreneurial activities. Their first project is Boulevard Market, a carefully curated food hall in beautiful downtown Montebello. It's committed to serving up good food, good drinks, and good vibes. In this video, we talk with Barney Santos about the difference between gentrification and hentification, keeping money local, and being greater than the sum of the stereotypes as a community. And thank you to Cat Footwear for sponsoring this episode. They're a premier shoe company that empowers builders and doers to reframe the world to create something more meaningful. This marks our final episode celebrating Hispanic Heritage Month, so let's go out with a bang. All right, welcome to the podcast on today's show, talking to Barney Santos from Hentify. For people who don't know, what does your company do? So Hentify is an investment firm. We invest in people, places, and programs in Latino communities, specifically for creatives to kind of build strong local economies and encourage people to invest back into their communities. You and I are like the only two developers. Hey. This is the first time. This is the first time. We're All like about the, young, it. the young developer crew of two LA. Two developers in the same room. All yeah. About yeah, it, yeah, 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 yeah. Love it. Which is nice because most developers don't collab necessarily. And so it's good yeah. to have like, a, I think we're both young and we have a collab. What was your first thing that like got you into real estate or even just curious? Like even as a kid, uh, maybe there was something, maybe Legos and you were like, oh, OK, maybe there's something here. Yeah. You know, interestingly enough, man, I was never interested in real estate at all whatsoever. And so like about about like 18, 19 years old. And it was funny because like I was essentially like I straight out of high school. I've always been a hustler, you know, like since forever. I mean, high school, I used to sell like chocolate when to the, your classmates. Yeah. I always laugh at this story. Cause it's like, I would find out when like this, the, the other classes were doing like their fundraisers and selling chocolates. And so like, I would buy chocolates at like a cheap price and then like mm -hmm. flip them <laughs> for like a way, like, you know, fundraiser price, you know, yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. catalog so no, price. You're right. So no one would say anything. <laughs> Uh, so, um, smart. but like after, after graduating, like I just, I, I wanted to see what I can get into. So I was going to go either work at the YMCA, which, you know, paying minimum wage at the time. I don't remember what it was, but then my homeboy, Jerry was like, Hey dude, like, like I'm working in real estate in a mortgage, in the mortgage side. Okay. Okay. And he, he was like, he saw me, saw my, like, you know, my candor, my, my charismatic sort of like nature at the time when I was really young. And he, he was like, look, here's my last check. I can, you can get paid this much. Or you can make you this much per hour. Yeah. yeah, yeah and I was yeah. like, yo, I want that check right there. <laughs> so, like, yeah. that was kind of like the star. I got into mortgage. It's like, like a that, Wolf you know. of Wall Street story. No, yeah. totally. Bro, <laughs> show me the pay stub. Show me the pay stub. And I quit my job <laughs> right now and come work for you. <laughs> he showed you the pay stub. And then he had me on the phones, like, the next day. Just, like, bam, bang, cranking them out. And I got a, I got a lead that first day. We worked it together. And so, like, within, like, two weeks, like, I got my first deal closed. And it was, like, a refinance. And ever since then, I was somewhat touching it. I had my own yeah. mortgage thing. And then fast forward, got into, like, foreclosure management for asset for the banks on the on the east side and then on east coast i should say and then uh yeah then eventually got into the real estate development not even by like oh that's what i want to do you know i i always whenever i get into ventures or projects it's always a byproduct of like what's the need and then i'm like okay how do i learn it right like i know you kind of like yeah yeah similar, similar like, very yeah. similar yeah and it just was the need at the time i'm like okay cool well like i'll have to learn development like just learn yeah. on the fly you're not gonna go to real estate school you know yeah. like, how'd you do what'd you do like for me, I just got this audio book of like oh. real estate terms. <laughs> oh, bro, no. I was I, like, oh, NOI. I was like little yeah. quizzing myself, NOI, IRR. Yeah. And I was like, oh, okay. So people listening, audio books help a lot. It's a cheat sheet. And every world has their own words. So if totally. you're a doctor, you got your words. And I think a lot of people are scared because they don't want to sound dumb. But it turns out there's like a really you know quick library of YouTube videos that'll tell you every acronym, every word. You could go be a surgeon tomorrow or at least pretend your way into the hospital. So you can learn anything nowadays. Yeah. Like I, I, for me, it was so don't be scared. People. Don't be scared. Don't be scared. Hundred percent. Jump into it because you'll learn. It was literally the real estate development for dummies book. Mm -hmm. Like I bought. I went yeah. to go buy real estate. I still have that book in my in my office. But it was most about like the due diligence, the first part of like the first six months of like real estate development. Sourcing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like your pre, what is a you know like a environmental phase one study, all that stuff, right? Like had to learn all that. Uh, and then as as it was going. I just kind of like, I'm not a person afraid not to ask questions. So like, I just ask everybody who I know who's in real estate, like, hey, what does this mean? And what does this do? Like, yeah. is this right? And so they would kind of give me guidance. So it was kind of cool that way. Yeah. And then what made you want to zone in on like the Montebello project in particular? Yeah. So that particular project was a byproduct of the fact that, so we were living in, my wife and I were living in downtown Los Angeles for like a good, I don't know, like a while, like eight years. We saw it develop from like before 
Ellie Lai before Rouse was in there. And so, like, got to saw the whole it was gentrification. Like a lot of parking lots. A lot of parking yeah. lots. Yeah. yeah, Joe's parking was just Dude, like Dude, Malcolm key. in the Middle owned parking lots. Malcolm in the Middle, really? Yeah, the actor. Like, he, I he believe had, it. Frankie yes, Muniz? Frankie, Frankie Muniz. He has a story where it's like he didn't know where to put his money, and he got all, a lot of advice, but he just wanted to be, like, the cheap parking lot guy in L.A. Like, that's what, he, that's what he wanted to be for no reason. And so he ends up buying all these lots around, like, where, you know, it's, it's all yeah. developed now. yeah. And then he ended up obviously selling them for a ridiculous amount of money, but he just wanted to be the cheap. So he'd go look across the street. If it was 10 bucks, he'd be nine bucks. Yeah. That's that crazy. Was it. Like that simple. And he just liked it. Like he just liked giving people a place to park. He probably cashed out crazy with the sales oh, too. For sure. Yeah. For I sure. mean, that yeah. stuff is real estate prime. I mean, yeah, yeah I, I, yeah, I mean, we, we was in that world. And so I like, got to see all of downtown LA develop and, and become kind of like what it is today and saw it gentrify completely. Uh, you know, I, I knew right away. I was like, I remember, I remember the moment. It was like at two o'clock in the morning. I looked out my window and I saw like this young 22 year old girl walking her poodle. And I was like, oh, okay. Like it's changing. Yeah, 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 it's like, yeah, downtown is not the same. At three in the morning. Yeah, right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, we moved to Montebello, my wife and I, cause uh, you know, downtown was just getting too expensive and I just was spending yeah. too much. I don't know if you know, like it's like when you're in that environment, you kind of want to spend like, and so like I was spending money, yeah. like, so easy, it's just easy. downstairs, you go to a bar, you go to, you right. know, you eat out. Yeah. Right. And so it was crazy. Came to Montebello and I noticed like, oh, wow, like, you know, Montebello, there's really, there was, at the time there was nothing much to do, like anything there within maybe like a handful of things that were just like traditional businesses, legacy businesses have been there forever. And so, you know, in, in their core downtown corridor, like I said, that with air quotes, right? Like I was like, well, this is a downtown. I just came from downtown. Like, where's the disconnect? Why is it that our Latino communities don't have this kind of like economically developed place that we can label as a downtown? And so I noticed there's a lot of cities like that, mm-hmm. and this, but the cities wanted to have that. Yeah. And so I saw this piece of land, there was a building right in the corner, right in the heart of it, empty, broken windows, graffiti, kind of like a lot of buildings in that downtown. Mm-hmm. And so I was like, all right, well, let's look into it. Like, let's see who owns it, what can we do with it, you know, to start that, just that whole process. Yeah. And so, uh, and come to find out the city owned it, been empty for like, I don't know, 15 years or so. City bought it with like redevelopment dollars that they weren't supposed to use. Right? And so like they were considering putting it up for RFP, right? With that property. And then there was like an acre of land behind it, but they wanted to par- partner with a larger developer. They weren't trying to, I mean, you know, I yeah, get always, it. It's always the case. Yeah, yeah. They, yeah. They're not trying to see like someone brand new and be like, oh yeah, here's an acre and a half. Like, right. Take right. it over. And I get it. So I started bringing people to the table. Like I brought Cesar Chavez Foundation to the table to do affordable housing behind us. And we do the retail. They could have pencil it out, met some other developers. And then finally, eventually just kind of like landed at a concept and some and met some good developers and jumped onto the RFP with them. But it wasn't until after like I spoke to hundreds of people in the city, found out what the real problem was, which essentially is, uh, you know, like people our age, kind of like, you know, upperly mobile millennials going to college, traveling, watching a lot of Anthony Bourdain yeah. were ex- wanting more out of life, retail, you know, like shopping, food. And the cities that we live in just aren't supplying that. And so, you know, there was a disconnect between supply and demand. Yeah. And the legacy businesses are scared to change because it's just, you know, they've been there for 20 years, 30 years, immigrant owned mostly. Yeah. And so they're not going to, it's a cash only business, you know, like, and stuff like that. So a lot of the talent was just leaving. And so they were just leaving the Montebello area, moving to West LA, downtown Hollywood. And so all that talent was gone, no businesses to serve them. And so I was like, all right, well, let's, let's definitely build something here and see if we can do something cool that can activate the street, you know, re, you know, revitalize the downtown. And yeah, Bell was the same. It was the same thing. It's like they, the, I think their biggest problem was how do we keep the young people here? Right. That was yeah. the whole thing. Like everyone was like thirties and there was nothing for them to do. And so they realized like all the, all the money leaves. I was, I grew up in Springfield, Massachusetts. And at the time there was an economic developer. Uh, his name is John judge. Great guy that I met. And he had this like excellent flow chart of like what happens once kids become 24 to 30 and they would all move to Boston. And even if they didn't move to Boston, and Boston is 90 miles away, the, there was like literally a, a graph of the money leaving yeah. Springfield because there was not much to do. There was stuff to do, Brain but not, drain. not too much. And it would just like, they would just drive to Boston for the weekend. Yeah. Like that's just what spend. kids did. Yeah. And, and they would spend all that money. And yeah. so his whole thing was like, man, how do we get the money to stay? Like, how do we build it? But it's hard. It's hard because it's yeah. like, I think, I think naturally people go, even if we build it, they won't come. That's the thing people get wrong. This is the myth. The, the biggest myth is we're going to do all this work and no one's going to care. And it's totally not the case. That's what I love about development. That's what, that's what I learned, I think, with Border X 
was it was just like a smashing success. And then I'd get these like DMs on Instagram around how a family would just be like, look, before I would Uber, first of all, I'd get a, I'd get a babysitter, yeah. right? So that's like 50 bucks. Then I'd Uber downtown. That's 40 bucks. Then I Uber back. That's another 40 bucks. And then we spend whatever, 50 bucks, 60 bucks at a brewery. Right. right? And so it's like a two, $300 night. And now they have the same experience for like 50 bucks. And local. Yeah. Right? And local. Right in yeah. their backyard. It's yeah. a Feel, sense of feels pride. Good. Yeah. yeah. Like and so once, you know, I started getting some of that. That was after, but it was like, oh, wow, this is, it can be that simple. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so the, the fear of failure, whatever it is, it, it doesn't need to be there. And it was funny because talking to a lot of investors too, like mm -hmm. even the investor community has that same sort of like mentality. They're yeah. just like, I don't know, it's too much of a risk. And you know, I don't know, I'd rather invest in like a West LA or like a downtown sure. or it's yeah, proven want, or whatever. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Except you're competing with a hundred other hundred percent. hundred percent. Yeah. That was my pitch. Like that was my pitch with like even recruiting the concepts and the food vendors. Like it was mm -hmm. like, you know, you know, you can go open up in downtown, sure, but you're competing with like Bestia and like, yeah. you know, like all these, you know, all these places. Or you can go to a place like Montebello or somewhere on the east side and stand out like crazy. You are the you the, are the, draw. the attraction, yeah. yeah, right. And so, like, people, some people got it, some people didn't. My thing for that was always, and I still use this all the time. It's basically like, look, it's density. So if within a five mile radius of anywhere in LA, like throw a dart, there's a million people. And for you to be successful as a business, you just need 100 or 200 of those to show up a day. Yeah. So pretty good odds. Yeah. You know, if this were in the desert, I'd say you have a point, Mr. Investor, <laughs> yeah. but you don't. You yeah. have no point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and LA is proven. I think of any other city, LA is proven that you can create destinations in places that no one would ever go. 100%. Right? And if the product's good, that's it. Or if there's a vibe. Yeah. You know, and I think that's my whole thing now. If there's five, if there's 1 million people within five miles, you win, period. That's yeah. it. You I mean, can build it, anything. The density is key, man. Yeah. And key. the diversity too, right? It's like you can yeah. you can build something for a niche niche market, but there's still a, a lot of those people too. Whatever those people look like. A ton of those people. I mean, Bell is a perfect example of that. Yeah. You know, and, and and even in that market itself, like there's still a lot of you can look at the data and see who's there, but there's a bunch of people who are like not on the data sheets, right? Like mm -hmm. sort of like uh, undocumented who totally. are just but there's a ton of them. Yeah. Ton of them. Yeah. There's a lot of us in this community is just kinda like ready to spend money but just have nowhere really cool to go to. And so like, I think there's a whole market to be tapped into. That's the thing you always talk about. You say like, we deserve nice stuff. Yeah. That's, that's the thing you say a lot. Yeah, I, I believe it Can you unpack that, unpack that, but like, what does that mean to you? Yeah, man, you know, I just, you know, it's, there's a lot of like stuff that people always have a conversation with me about in relation to like Latino communities and like what, what is there and what's usually gets opened up in these places. And so like, you know, and I get it, right? Like people want to pander to like, the lowest common stereotype right but i think we're greater than the sum of our stereotypes as a community and so you know a lot of times what happens you'll see people open up concepts that have like all kinds of pictures of like frida kahlo or you know conchas on the wall or whatever right and so i'm just like well you know that's cool and there's a market for that totally i'm not just like discriminating against that either but i just feel like there is a community that wants nice stuff that you can get only like on the west side or downtown that still feels authentic that still feels like connected to who we are as people and all it is is just little touches and nuances of design aesthetic music right all that stuff like you know all that stuff you, you programming and so that's what i mean by like okay well our community deserves nice stuff because not saying that there isn't nice stuff there it's just that i think the elevated experience that people want from totally. our community is it's totally. hard to find. And so yeah. I think that's a key. Element. That was always my thing. Like uh, being from Peru, there's a bunch of Peruvian restaurants here yeah. or in, in general, like everywhere. But every time I go to one, it would just, it would be like the design would be awful. It'd be super run down. And it's a thing that like when you, when you peel back the onion, being in Peru, if you were in Peru in like the eighties, even the architecture is really built around like safety first. It's built around there's fences outside, you know, there's spikes on the things. And it's something you don't see in America. Like that's not a thing you grow up with. And so when you're a culture that's at some point was at war and all this stuff or whatever, or like civil war, then it defines the architecture. We just want a meal. Like we don't care how it looks, right? But then you move to America, a different culture. Right. It's got, it has to be both. You have to, and if you have a cocktail program, that has to be good too. All three of these things have to exist. And I'm seeing more of that now. Now there's like obviously some pretty good Peruvian restaurants around LA and with great design, beautiful bar program, the yeah. whole thing. But it's like the migration of the cultural mindset yeah. of like, give yourself permission to be free kind of a thing. Yeah. Because it, it stems, it's like it stems back from, you know, oppression or just, or just these like, well, the bare just, minimum. I just want safety. Yeah, I just want, I just a want the bare minimum. Yeah. Like, I'm good with it just being like 
good food and that's it. Like, and the common theme I always hear is like, it's not, it's got to be better than what I can make at home. And the experience has to be better too, right? Totally. Especially COVID. Mm-hmm. COVID like threw a whole like oh, left yeah. curve, yeah, you know? So it's true. It's got to be way, because people learn how to cook. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So it's like, yeah. it's got to be really I learned good. how to drink a lot more. <laughs> <laughs> a lot more. Yeah. But yeah, Salvadorian food too. Like, I, you know, I'm a Salvadorian and like, same thing with, pupu- like, you know, getting pupusas everywhere all over town. Same exact thing. Like, it's very, very few and far in between Salvadorian places that you find like, the, whoa, that's this true. is dope. Like, yeah. good location, good spot. Which is like why I love Vicho so much, right? Yeah, like, right. that's kind of like yeah, a marriage. Shout out of, to Vicho. Yeah. Yeah. great. Yeah. Yeah. So they kind of, they know how to balance the two. Uh, which is which is hard to do. Give people a sense of the program that you have at, at the location at Boulevard Market. Yeah, so Boulevard Market essentially is uh, you know indoor outdoor food hall has an old one hundred year old building that you know we repurpose and we gutted, uh, reinforced it, kept the bones of it to make it look gorgeous and old. And then we have the outdoor courtyard, which we kind of there was a building outside we tore down. So we can open wide because we kind of looked at we studied architecture from like Europe and you did kind of like. We saw like how Europeans do food halls and how Mexico City does food halls and just in general architecture. We liked how like in Spain, how they have sort of like this general design where it's almost like enclosure and then they have like a community inside of that. And it almost like felt, you're talking about like the Barcelona. Um, yeah. The, yeah. The square blocks. That's and, right. The yeah, square blocks. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's it's exactly right. We kind of like that idea of like, OK, you can create this insulated experience, you know, still within this grand, grander sort of conversation of the street. And we landed at that because it was the most cohesive to creating like it's almost like in, inner density, right? If yeah. it feels like a tight environment, so we have a total of eight concepts in total at Boulevard Market. Um, you know, we have I think it's like uh, five outside in shipping containers, and then three inside in the building. What's the mix of like food and drink? or yes. dessert stuff like that yeah, it's mostly all food the only thing that's not food well is coffee right so we have cafe okay, santo right. cafe yeah. santo the Oaxaca, amazing oaxacan coffee yeah they're really really artisans when it comes to their coffee and then we have alchemy craft which is the bar that my mm-hmm. wife and i own but other than that it's all food everybody else is what food. has been the hard part of this so whenever i tell people about development it's, there's a lot more behind the scenes in terms of working with the tenant to help them understand business or their financials and i think i think like people like us know that but I think the world doesn't, right? And so like we have a publicist on our team and it's the same. I'm like, you wouldn't believe the level of like consulting that we end up doing for some of these companies because it's like, I can't make beer, doesn't make me dumb. They don't know how to create a deck, doesn't make them dumb. But when we're doing this for these communities, it's like very much a collaborative, a lot more there than, than I think people realize. It's an interesting dynamic, I will say that. That is probably the one surprising thing that if I were to tell people, people would be like shocked about. Because everyone thinks everything's got it's together. You know what I mean? It's <laughs> yeah. totally not. Yeah. Um, first of all, like for us, we're dealing with seven other businesses, right? With the bar. So I deal with myself. But like but you're reliant on yeah. them. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. So and two of those is an incubator. So we have an incubator program at Boulevard. So we have one kitchen that's our our restaurant. We own the permit. It's our kitchen. We have two concepts working out of there. So we're really hands on with them, right? Like we're, you know, we we, we meet with them often, talk about their P and Ls, help them put together. Is that like, you or do you have a team? Yeah, so it's, it's myself with? and with Claudia. So Claudia Morales, shout out to Claudia. She is an amazing. She I met her at USC. She was in the social entrepreneurship program, but she has a background in like, you know, a nonprofit world and uh, case management and working with. Uh, organizations and since she got work started working with me she's been she dived deep into like the food space and food security Um, but she runs that with me and so we both kind of like do our parts she helps with like more of the organization the operations side of the program creating all the documents and like everything formalities and metrics reporting and meeting with them also and then I do a lot of the business advising. So like I help with giving the feedback about marketing, about their P&Ls, about their numbers. Raise your prices. Um, yeah. Well, <laughs> well, you know, even, but Pay even, yourself. even as little as like menu design and like yeah. people don't understand the nuance of like. Yeah. Don't have 40 things on the menu. Well, y- 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 <laughs> yes, yes. But also don't be like the cheesecake factory, <laughs> <laughs> the placement of what, of what you want to sell. Like also like there's a, there's a lot of studies about like, you know, putting the stuff you really want to sell the high, the most, the best margin stuff in more on the eye line versus like above mm-hmm. or below. Like if you, you know, there's little things like that. You kind of like, once you start implementing them, you'll see like massive ticks yeah. and sales. And so signs matter. Signs matter. Border X, we learned that they didn't have anything. They had it like up there, like in the rafters, which was cool. It looked cool. Yeah. But no one would, 
it, you know, like this. And yeah, so then yeah, they yeah. put it behind the TV. Benny Boy just did it, actually. They, so Benny Boy now has one. They lowered it. So they have two. They have one that is eye level, but yeah. then there's always a line. Like, if it's busy, there's a line of, like, 20, yeah. 30 people. And so if you're in that, if you're, like, let's say 10 people deep, you now, there's one for you. Uh, and so the whole idea there is you're right, you know, as soon as you order, you're ready. You already know to go. Yeah, yeah. that's great. And so, But it's, like, little things, like, yeah. to your point. That make the biggest Big difference. difference. Yeah. But you know, all that hand holding with, with our groups, which is phenomenal. I, that's the point where we did it. Like we love that. It, it's been such a joy to see people develop in their in their business. Yeah. But then there's also the inner dynamics of how to even communicate with different tenants, right? Because like, every tenant is so different in how they function and how they work and how their styles. Some are extremely assertive. Some are really like, I'll do anything it takes to make this work. And some are a little more lax in sort of their marketing approach. And some people have, you know, like maybe they don't do any marketing. Do you do all the programming for them? We or, do, or do you yeah. like collaborate, I guess, maybe? In we some kind way? of collaborate. I mean, we kind of like set the precedent for... Like, okay, well, this is what we're going to do. We try to do one big activation per month at Boulevard. Okay. That's like what we decided to do. And you had a big one. You yeah. A TV. Yeah. Yeah. Tell so, people about that. That was dope with Netflix. Yeah. So we did one last year around, I think it was November, which is pretty crazy because considering the fact that we were just open like for two months and yeah. they caught wind. We partnered with Netflix on the season two premiere of Hentified, the show Hentified. Which is funny because our name, yeah, company, exactly. company name is Hentify. Yeah. So, um, it's a perfect pair. Perfect. Yeah, it really was. Did they know about that ahead of time? I, no. Uh, one of my friends uh, from grad school kind of connected us. Uh, Jessica, she connected me to Michael, who was on the team at the time. Netflix had built out some like a multicultural marketing team focused yeah. on community. And they were going to do some activation, I think, with like a food truck and go to like a film premiere. It was kind of like pretty standard. Pretty standard. It was, it's kind of yeah. yeah. not really interesting. Not it. And she, Yeah, exactly. And so <laughs> she was like, no, don't do that. Talk to Barney, blah, blah, blah. Sorry, so it was this whole thing. And so we had a conversation initially what it could look like, and then they turned, ran it up the chain of command. And apparently, America Ferrera, who was like the, the person who created the show, she was like, oh, I love it. Let's do it. And so, yeah, we had two activations at, at Boulevard. One was at like a private event where it was just like all the influencers, people from the show, uh, America Ferrera was there, Eva Longoria, like all the creators. They all kind of came out and partied, and, and we had a good time there. But they also did like a lot of press that day, so they had live, you know, streaming interviews and then the second one which was my favorite part which was like the public facing event and that was a major activation i shut down the street next to us i i, I asked a bunch of like low riders to come and hang out and right local pop-ups because you know it's yeah. like whittier boulevard it's like the, the culture of the downtown mm -hmm. and uh, we gave away like 100 items for each vendor people had special menus that they created for that were like based on the show it was like nice. a dope activation That's i found awesome. like a paletero cart guy i was giving away a pop i mean it was just so cool yeah, it was really yeah. representation of the community but it felt authentic. It wasn't like pandering, you know? Yeah, like, right, it, was yeah. like, it was like an authentic. <laughs> yeah. and, and it was packed. I mean, it was crazy packed. What has been the hard part? Like, have you had tenant turnover? Or what has been, what's been the part yeah. that surprised you on the other side of it? Thankfully, we haven't had any tenant turnover. Like, that is actually, I'm really proud. The fact that we've been yeah. open for a year. That's and amazing. Zero tenant turnover, which is actually, from what I hear, is kind of rare. Yeah. I have a couple other friends. Because you give a shit. A lot, dude. That's, that's like, why. Like, a lot. Like, <laughs> I tell people it can be that simple. Just care. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it's, it is true. It it's is true. Honestly, shocking. it is true. Yeah. But, you know, like we care about so much the experience for the customer and we do a lot. We change. We're constantly iterating, changing lights, like adding plants, doing this, changing the music. I mean, we, you're learning as you go. All do it's constant yeah. iteration, mm -hmm. constant iteration. But, you know, I studied entrepreneurship at Cal State and, and uh, at USC and a little bit uh, other places. And it was all about tech and like the whole iteration process of like customer discovery and development. And so, you know, uh, lean startup methodology. And so like, for me, it's like, it's like, I'd rather, I opened it. I'm like, all right, let's just constantly improve. We'll, we'll eventually get to the place where it's perfect, you know, but right now let's constantly add, 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 add. Yeah. So it's been good. That helps a lot. I mean, but the hardest thing I think for us has been, you know, initially I didn't, I didn't think about the dynamics of in order for everyone to be super successful, we have to have an enormous amount of transactions that happen on a monthly basis. We have to probably have like about 25 to 30,000 transactions that go through that place a month yeah. for everybody to be like, we're good. So that's a, that's a so pretty like 50 grand, 60 grand, something like that. 50, 60,000 total for transactions all the vendors, for the, all the vendors like month. per month. Okay. Yeah yeah, yeah. 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 So that's roughly about, yeah, it could be like about 40 to 60,000 per, per vendor. Per vendor. Yeah. 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 yeah that makes sense. Um, yeah. So, you know, so 
that's a whole, it's a lot of traffic, right? Yeah. It's a whole lot of traffic. And how, how big is the whole space? It's about 8,500 square feet. Okay. So it's, it's, and there's some outdoor space too. Yeah. That's yeah. that courtyard. Yeah. So that's, that's predominantly where people want to hang out. Yeah. Uh, it's Especially rightfully after so. COVID, yeah. Yeah. It was a premium for Where's us. Where's the bar? Is the bar outside? No, it's inside. Okay. Yeah. But it's, it works because people come in and out and they kind of. Is it you making drinks? Do you ever go back there and do your thing? I did in the beginning. That's a what lot. I would do. I would totally do that. I did. It was fun. Yeah. That's totally. My wife would yeah. totally get pissed at me. Why are you back there? I do. I mean, he has two items. Pisco sour margarita. That's yeah. it. And if you want yeah. a beer, my I got wife you. was totally like, "Get out of there! You shouldn't be there. You should be hiring people." But it, it was fun. It's fun. Yeah, yeah it's, it's fun. interactive. You, it's you, also like the feedback, right? The thing you're, the thing, yes. the entrepreneurship thing you're talking 100%. about. You know when it's broken, 100%. and like people tell you, or like you can see the expression on their face, and that's that's something that's how I look at it. I'd be like, I'm gonna make great drinks, but also get the feedback and just talk. Just totally. be like, what's going on? What's what would you eat? Yeah. Did you like it? So then when you Where do you hire, seating? you know exactly what you're looking for. But you're also for, watching right? how you're like, watching. You do, yeah. like how yeah. humans, because the human being is funny. It's where super funny. The, you, you'll see them enter. What do they do? Then you'll take notes. Right. Oh, they're going, oh, this is where they go more often. Okay. And then they, they found me to get a drink. Was that obvious or not? And then like, where do they go after that? And mm-hmm. you'll see the behavior. 100%. Yeah. You never know the behavior until 100%. you're open, no matter what an architect tells you. Yeah, hundred percent. They do weird shit. Yeah, they, they, it's, <laughs> and they, and or they can. But it's dope because it's alive. They they go right. where is the most intuitive, right. the the path of least resistance, right? Yeah. Essentially, and so like I get it. But you're right. That was the constant. I was always looking, asking, and then also on top of that, the process for us. The bar is like I always looked at it as like a how do you make it like a vending machine in the sense of a soda like you just pick a button he comes out a product right like yeah. in the sense of efficiency and time, yeah. so even the drinks and we mix mixed drinks like how do you cut the how do you cut the time like how do you make right. it faster right so like our margaritas like we pre make them and put them in kegs so it's like, like faster well drinks oh nice yeah, yeah. so like stuff fits so it moves quick 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 so we could turn the customer over because people get pissed like it's weird yeah. Yeah. like at a bar in Hollywood you wait what like maybe twenty minutes sometimes thirty minutes for a drink but they're going to Boulevard yeah. Market so they don't have to to have that experience exactly yeah. but they'll get pissed if yeah. they wait for 20 minutes exactly. you know and so I don't believe that yeah so you know we we try to cut it and we try to we get it down to like you know two to three minutes like per customer so we kind of just burn it through fast but um it was a lot of that in the beginning but now i'm 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 no longer like behind the bar and yeah. now my team's like get out of here you know yeah, yeah, yeah get out of so here of course they, they no make one fun. wants dad to be home yeah yeah yeah, yeah exactly yeah. that's so. how it goes <laughs> <laughs> no my team's awesome though they're great i love them they're it's like a family man we just celebrate like i said a year and did you have them like on flexible leases just because you didn't know or was it all, are they all on long-term leases yeah, or, they, or maybe they even preferred that? No, that was extent. the one thing that we, because we didn't build out the tenant improvement spaces, like okay. they, they invested in their own tenant improvements. They, yeah. we got, we gave them like long-term leases to kind of help offset that. Cause yeah. the t- typical food home model is the developer develops everything, builds up the kitchens and then gives people like a one year lease. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Cause food halls, you know, they, you never know something might hit, might not. And yeah. they ask people to leave or whatever we're like we're vested into this all of us and yeah. so like we want to make sure everyone's successful we're playing with the concept around like a startup to storefront building where it's like we do this similar thing yeah. but the people inside of just like fans and members of the podcast people that have been on like vitros or oh like yeah. yeah xcj all these different companies and then creating like a cool immersive space where it's like what we have one empty space all the time for a company that might be new or like like the, the let us grow in the back yeah, yeah, so yeah. they do pop-up sometimes but that's new to them uh, and so it could be a place for them like let, just do a pop-up do a bunch of these cool farm stands in a really unique way That's and now dope. it's like but it's creating the the here we are serving entrepreneurs and trying to make more and now we have a space right yeah. so it's like it's almost like the eat your own dog food type thing yeah 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 totally, it's totally. like you, you like, kind of like what we did here yeah but more of them yeah 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 so no we're, i like that idea with the idea but again it's like I know nothing about that. You know, it's the same thing. It's like starting over like, oh, okay, let me break it. Although that's dope though, right? I mean, it I is. personally, exciting, I, yeah. I, if you're like me, like I, I love learning Yeah. the part of the start where you have to immerse yourself in something totally. that's brand new. That's, I like that. Like, I'm sure you guys did that when you started the podcast too, right? It was oh, like a for massive sure, yeah. deep dive into this thing. Wow. This thing was like an art, to be honest. That's what I like about it. When people ask me like, oh, you know, did you ever think it'd be a business? I'm like, honestly, no. Like everything you see has just been a slow evolution yeah. and natural, like very organic you know we had like one follower on youtube that was, <laughs> <laughs> yeah but that's the game Thanks, and then it's just like, uh, literally, like shout just out to mom yeah but it's dumb i mean i walk just, in here and i'm like this yeah, is like legit right. you guys have a studio it's becoming or? its own yeah. thing which is great but also just talking to people right so it's also like to me this is therapy to me this is mind share to yeah. me this is making like deeper connections and so yeah it also satisfies a lot of things that aren't on any financial statement, right? Totally. Yeah. Yeah. And so for 100%. me, it's like worth it. It's like, that's cool. In fact, some, somebody, I remember it was like, cause I used to run the center for entrepreneurship at Cal State LA. And, um, uh, I remember it was like 2016, 17. Somebody, I remember a kid asked me like, if you can give me some advice of like what to do. He was like an undergrad, um, to like just learn more about different things. And I was like, dude, start a podcast. 
and just invite people like you know because i just think the idea of just getting that mind share and like talking to some awesome people like it's just good like intrinsically just for yourself outside of the business side of it just to personally learn you know yeah and people like it too i mean if you're like we provide great content and so it's like your people aren't just coming on to waste time with us it's like ideally we're <laughs> yeah. gonna put their 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 tidbits out into the world and other people right. can you know, hopefully it grows their, their little audience or whatever they're trying to do too. Yeah. 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 I mean, that's dope. I, Which we've yeah, seen. We were touching on exploring that idea of like, what do we want to do? A podcast was one of those things, not for us to do, but to provide a space for the community yeah. to do it, you know, because I think that's the other component too. That's like a lot of people just don't have that access. Like right. this equipment like costs money, you know? And so there's a lot of creative people that just have the gab and they want to do it and they can express themselves, but they just don't have a space to do that. So there's, there's ideas like that we've been exploring too about kind of how we can, I mean, the whole goal for us as a company is like, how do you empower people, right? The creatives in the community to kind of do their thing without getting in their way. What and, are you working uh, on now? So we're, we're, we're dialing in even more like Boulevard, you know, as you know, like sometimes building something is great and you could pass it off and hands off a little bit, but like, you know, we operationalize Boulevard Market, operationalize the bar completely, 100%, so that I'm not, it's not dependent on me at all whatsoever. And we're, we're pretty close to that now. We have all our people in place. And then the next project we're working on is we just want an RFP for this. For, for those of you who don't know, it's like a request for proposal for a city okay. for a, a development in the city of Whittier. Whittier has this like downtown area. It's called Uptown Whittier. And um, yeah, it's great location, developed, has a lot of businesses there, um, but it's not really cohesive. There's nothing really connecting it all together. Mm -hmm. And so the city had like six acres of land that oh. they wanted to develop. They wanted to do housing, affordable housing, market rate housing, and then retail. And so essentially the RFP that we applied for was to jump in with, three, with two other partners to do this collective six acre development. So we're taking on the retail side of it. And so... Oh, nice. The next project will be, you know, we're finalizing everything, we, the ENA agreement and all that stuff with the city. But, um, yeah, it's about 11,000 square feet right in the heart of their uptown, like piece of land that's been there for like 30, 40 years. Yeah. Just land, not even, there's nothing on it. So it's like perfect. And right behind it is this massive, like, five-story, like, um, parking structure, which is like gold for us. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah it's perfect. Yeah, part. 100%. So, so it'll be like a similar concept? Similar in the sense that it will be retail food community focused. Yeah. But like, I don't, I don't think I'm going to use containers. You know, for yeah. me, the containers thing, it was never, I'm, I'm not like. I've heard they don't last or they kind of get run down. No, not even that. I mean, for sure. They're mobility material, like anything, yeah. right? But like, I think for me, the, the use of the, the material was more of like, I was inspired by like downtown project and like Tony Shea. You know, they were they were our advisors when we first started the, the development. We actually reached out to Zappos and they showed us and, you know, they were like, oh, you know, you could do this in your town. And at the time, nobody was doing it. Mm -hmm. And then more people started doing it yeah. in the community. So it's not as it became a fad. Yeah. Well, I would say it's like right at the border now okay. right of that. Like and yeah. so I, anything more than now, I'm like, OK, it's not cool. It's not hip. It's not innovative anymore. The thing that excites me is how can you do something different? Like, how do you, like, change the landscape a little bit and make people think differently and inspire them to kind of, like, invest in their communities in new ways? And so we're trying to figure out how we can do that with this new space. Like, how do we still do the idea of Boulevard, like, in a different fashion, but, like, using different materials, different design methods and see how we can approach it? I'm, I want to do something new with retail and change it a little bit. So we'll see how that works. It's still We're still in the... I'm ID. excited, dude. Yeah, I'm yeah. excited. Cliffhanger. Yeah, I mean, me too. That's good stuff. I, but I'm sure it'll be great. I mean, the team <laughs> that we put together, it's a bunch of creative people. And, like, the one thing I like to do is I like to kind of let people do their thing. I don't want to get in their way. Sure. Like, I kind of, like, say, like, this is the prompt. Yeah. This And then push. And we kind of, like, can't, let's push it a little bit more. Let's push it a little more. And then we kind of fine-tune it. But I think the creative abrasion part of it is, is my best, is my favorite part. Like, yeah. this, this aspect of, like, the design and the elements, the division, like, that's fun. Because it's, like, cre it's all creative and it's and it's, 100%. then you figure out how to do it, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, that's no, the best 100%. part. Too. Well, in the vein of, of what's next, last week, I think you tweeted out something like, if I don't build a business within the next year, I'm going to buy one. Yeah, Yo, you saw that? Yeah, I did. <laughs> yeah. It's a really cool statement. We go deep. We go yeah, deep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But I wanted to like pick your brain on that and like what's in your mind for like what you would build or what you would buy and how that would factor into what you're already doing. Yeah, I mean, so I think for me, it's a byproduct of like, okay, like I want to keep growing. I want to keep sure. investing in the community. And so that's the that's where it comes from 100% wholly. Like the more opportunities we get to invest, the more jobs we can create, the more opportunities we can give to entrepreneurs. So when I look at, okay, like I'm starting to get anxious now a little bit, like, you know, building and managing 
two different things altogether, right? And so like I like managing a lot. It's great, but I love building. I'm a, I'm I love creating. So I'm getting a little anxious now. And so like I'm like now I'm wanting okay like how do we what's the next thing I want to sink my teeth into? The Whittier project is going to take a lot of time. We have another thing that we're working on right now. I can't announce, but it's if it goes through, it'll be a big thing for next year um, for Boulevard, the extension of our brand. But I think the next phase is like okay, like either we're going to do, launch something new or acquire something. I've always been fascinated with this idea of like private equity, right? But like for good, for, for you know, because a lot of private equity is all about like slashing costs and firing people. So like, how do you leverage private equity and innovative model at the local level? Like, can you do roll ups? Can you acquire like legacy businesses that are like sort of the owners are want to retire and they have nobody to pass it on to? Like, can you buy like 10 of them and roll them into one concept and then scale, you know, like across the board? You know, so things like that are kind of interesting to me. And then how do you leverage a layer of social impact on top of that? Like, can you do workforce development programming? Can you do entrepreneurship training on those things? That's the layer that I, every project we want to sink our teeth into has to have a layer of that. It, it can't just be, I mean, there's going to be probably some projects that are purely like a pure capitalistic endeavor to help create more like revenue for the other stuff. Mm-hmm. There, but mostly everything has to have some sort of social impact and enterprise uh, along, along, to, along the line. So to, to answer your question, yeah, like, yeah, it's just, I'm getting anxious and I need to yeah. sink my teeth into something. And, Let it drive you, bro. Let that right. anxiety drive you. Bro. Yeah, well, totally does. Everything it totally. you're talking about, it has to do with the community. And earlier you talked about how these legacy businesses uh, in Montebello were against it. And I'm sure you faced some, some NIMBYers pushing back on, on the gentrification. And I'm just curious how you deal with that because when no one knows you and no one knows like your intentions or anything, like how do you address that pushback from the community that you are trying to enrich and yeah. and all that stuff. Yeah, so, you know, Hentify comes from the term Hentification, which is, so gentrification is when outsiders come in and push people out, you know, you know intentionally or unintentionally, but yeah. Hentification is when people from the community invest back into their community, right? So, like, they're opening up concepts and businesses, and they do it in a responsible way that's uh, in alignment with kind of, like, the fabric, the social cultural fabric that's there, yeah. you know, hopefully creating interventions to help offset some of the negatives, right? At least that's what I think. And so the company Hentify we built wanted to be the action verb of that. And so, like, how do we initiate that more in the communities that are considered our communities with local people driving it? So for me, it's like, okay, well, knowing that every project we sink our teeth into, there is a lot of research that goes in that we have to do, like meeting the community, having car- like even before Montebello, we met with probably over 200 people, like just from the local community, local organizations, uh, chamber of commerce, council members, like leaders in the community. We, we had town hall meetings, not even to say this is what we're doing, but like, hey, what do you want? Like, what what is it you need? So my opinion, like, asking the community and asking them what they're nervous about and afraid about like first and trying to figure out how do you create interventions to offset that stuff right so i think that's the key is being intentional as you possibly can so you're tapping into like their their fear of the, is of the unknown and so the more information that you can provide them the better off they'll be and the more supportive they'll be yeah, I mean, I, I think the easier it is for you to get an honest representation of what the needs of the community are, right? And so you can address them directly and build something that that will have a higher chance of being successful and also, you know, try to offset some of those negative externalities that you don't want. Um, look, I mean, gentrification is a real thing, right? Like, it's a real thing. But by the time a restaurant pops up in the corner, it's a byproduct of things that are already taking place, right? Like the community is already changing and so like communities change on their own like they evolve over time they just do the question is is how do you create interventions and how do you be responsible about how you participate right in evolutions can you do it responsibly can you do it effectively can you lobby for more affordable housing can you leverage your 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 voice and like work with council members to create more policies to help offset some of those negative things that's what my feelings are it's like how do you be responsible in the community so like we generally haven't gotten much pushback because I think people see us as genuinely caring about those things. I, mean, I remember with, with Benny Boys, the same as like we literally knocked on doors at the beginning of this. Yeah. Really, the hypothesis is, do you want me here or not? And if not, that's OK. We can have the discussion. I can move this project somewhere else. Mm-hmm. And that's really it. And I think if but it takes time. I mean, you got to be willing to knock on people's doors, introduce yeah. yourself to, to the and yeah, I don't know. It's a. It's a relationship is the way I, I phrase it. And that, those things take time. Well, I, what we don't want to do is pretend like we know what the solutions are. Right. Right. Like yeah. 
what I do know for sure is the community knows what the problems are. And so the more we can hear the voice of the community, understand what the problems are, the better it is that we can sort of interpret that and say like, okay, well, this is essentially the insight we're, we're extracting from that. And this is the solution that we could potentially create to address those things. On Benny Boy, it was funny. So the, the building or the lot was zone PF, which means public facility, which means it's meant for like a hospital or like a fire station, something like that. But it's too small. It was too small to build anything like that on. You couldn't park it. And when we were going through like the approval process, there was somebody that put out into the news, like the local news saying the government was spending money and instead of building something for the public, they were building a brewery. (laughs) And so we had this like weird, I mean, it felt very like fake news, Trump, very like, I don't even know how to combat this, you know? And so I'm like, I'm there at the neighborhood council just explaining this and I have someone like yelling because they They're firmly sure believe yeah, yeah. and they, i'm they like read the headline and they bought in yeah and, I, and and it's like it's the moment where you realize logic doesn't matter you know i'm like like even saying something like why would the government pay for a brewery yeah. like that's dumb like yeah. that doesn't matter to them and so it was it, it was cra- it was weird yeah. it was the first time i had literally dealt with that and someone on the neighborhood council was the one who who, who leaked that and so they were they oh. were pushing that narrative they and had their so agenda it, they had an agenda and yeah. it was like super weird Sometimes that happens. But that happens. Man. Yeah, yeah happens. that was a good experience because I was like, even even, <laughs> it's nothing you can do in right. that situation. I can't undo the fact that this human believes. Yeah. That mm-hmm. thing, and I was like, all right, well. And, and sometimes well, okay. people might not even really believe it, but they just have a thing. Also, yeah. like I don't know. There's a, lately we've been getting some a couple of people like. There is a crosswalk in front of our property that like that is dangerous as hell. <laughs> there is mm-hmm. just no yeah. lights. It's like horrible. I, I almost get hit all the time by it. And people are like, "You should fix it." And I'm like, "Well, dude, I don't like I don't have that kind don't of dough." Yeah, like, I don't, yeah. Like, right. that's a, it's a city, you know. Yeah. I talk to city all the time. I try to lobby on behalf. I try to get signatures to get people to see. You know, yeah. next thing is we're trying to talk to the, the council. I mean, the congresswoman or like uh, supervisors see if they have funds for it. I mean, we could do our part, but it's like, it's difficult to kind of like do civil type of like, you know, improvements like that. It's like, I'm doing that with Benny Boys right next to it. There's like this, at the bottom of the street, there's this beautiful view of downtown LA uninterrupted. Caltrans is there, Union Pacific is there. And then because of the popularity of the brewery, people cross that super busy road. Uh, and so I've been pitching this. I made an Instagram video about this. Uh, people started like fighting each other on the video. I had the street artists have my back because yeah. it, it was a dumping site. This whole thing's like they, like old couches get laid out here. Yeah. And so I'm like, why Why are people fighting me around like me trying to make this like an art walk or something like a cool yeah, vibe yeah, yeah, for everybody? Yeah, yeah. And even when we were filming there, there were tons Those of discarded needles, needles I mean, all over the ground. Oh, and so then like I've been pitching this for a long time to the council members and to I had Gensler on board. And then Gensler pitched this project unbeknownst to me internally and it got selected which means now I have a staff of six people at Gensler working on this. Oh, awesome. And I like know the Caltrans people, the UP people, but it's the same. It's like, this is going to take me to the, probably the Olympics. For sure. But we're starting the, the discussion. Processes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we're going to, crosswalk's a big part of it. Lighted, yep. lighted crosswalks, slowing down the street, a bunch of art. Yeah. And so we'll, we'll start to have a lot of those community discussions, you know, probably in like two months time, but people always ask me oh he's doing it because he's making money i'm like there's no money to be made on this thing. Yeah, yeah. i'm just doing this because yeah. i look at this neighborhood and it was a dumping site yeah and that doesn't make any sense to yeah. me you want it's better. the most beautiful yeah, view of downtown nice la yeah. and i think people deserve that yeah I, I think it's simple and as i that. have the skill sets like yeah. the, right i have the things to like I, i'm the right chef for this particular situation yeah, yeah, yeah. that's it i think some people just aren't aware of the process either right it's, it's, yeah i think that's yeah, they're, hard. they're completely unaware they think it's as simple as like you know like i don't know pay 5,000 bucks and like take care of it or, you know, like, or just bring it up to the council member and right. make sure you tell them it has to be done. Yeah. It's like so much more, yeah. so much more involved. And so it's, it's a little different, but yeah. yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, like it's great. I mean, the, the in, investing in community is always going to pay off no matter what, like yeah. the ROI just from a community standpoint is huge. Like, uh, yeah, yeah, I truly believe that. Like, and impact massive, massive. Yeah. Well, Barney, thanks for coming on the podcast, man. Tell Thank people you, man. where they can Appreciate find it. you, how they can support Boulevard Market. Yeah, so they can just follow us on Instagram at BLVDMRKT, or they can follow me on Instagram at Barney Santos, B-A-R-N-E-Y-S-A-N-T-O-S. Yeah. Legend. Thank you, brother. Thank you, yeah, bro. Appreciate, Appreciate you coming on the show. Absolutely. My pleasure. Hey, you. Yeah, you listening. Thank you so much for making it to the end of the episode. Make sure to follow us on Instagram, subscribe on YouTube, and we cannot wait to see you next week for another great episode. Cheers.